So I'm here today with Olwyn Fourier, who plays the lead role of Violet Gibson in the documentary film Violet Gibson, The Irish Woman Who Shot Mussolini. Olwyn is an actor, director, and creative artist whose extensive work has spanned theater, film, the visual arts, music, dance theater, and literature. Olwyn, welcome to Calgary virtually, and thank you for taking the time to speak to the European Calgary European Film Festival today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And so jumping straight into some questions about this exciting film. So Violet Gibson, the Irish woman who shot Mussolini, is a fascinating story about the bravery of an Irish woman back in the 1920s, but who was largely forgotten in the history books and really in the passage of time. So the first general question would be, after getting into her kind of mindset, who was Violet Gibson? Well, she was she was actually from a very, very upper class, more Anglo Irish type of family. Um, you know, she actually she was presented to the Queen and all sorts of things. Um, but she she very early on in her life um, began to get interested in the you know, in the she, she began to resist, I suppose the the kind of um, dominant. Uh, ruling systems of her time, and um, became very, and she became very involved with with uh, with Mus, you know, with with the whole Mussolini story, and became and 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 quite early on saw him. She kind of pr could predict the sort of threat he was. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's quite a brilliant book about Violet Gibson, which I would really recommend written by Francis Stoner Saunders, who's also the main interviewee in the film. And uh, all the details you will get about the evolution of Violet's thinking and, um, and the kind of traumas that uh, marked her life as well are in that book. It's an extremely readable book and it, it gives you a sense of how she evolved into the kind of person she was, who, uh, uh, of course, totally against her family's um, totally against the grain of her family, which is partly why they ended up making sure she was put away as a mad woman. Oh, very interesting. What was it like to portray a character, or I mean, a real individual like Violet Gibson in a movie? Did you see any similarities maybe with possibly events from the past with various, various things uh, that have happened in history? Could you relate well, to the character pretty I, I, easily? Well, the interesting thing is I had not long beforehand done, um, done, done my own adaptation of The Voice of the River in Finnegan's Wake. I called it River Run. Mm -hmm. And through my research in creating that piece, I got very interested in Lucia Joyce. And by a, a, an extraordinary twist of fate, Lucia Joyce and Violet Gibson ended up in the same asylum in Northampton. Okay. And would have probably met. Uh, and Lucia was an, a little bit similar to Violet, had a very, um, Lucia was a real visionary. I mean, as a dancer, she was an extraordinary dancer, um, but was constantly being moved around by the family and also dismissed a great deal. That a lot of emphasis was on Georgia, her brother, um, because she was a young woman and all of that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and Lucia, similarly, um, I think, her rebellion against her lot and, uh, and the fact that she wasn't given the opportunity, in Lucia's case, the fact that she wasn't given the opportunity be, being branded as mentally unstable. And um, she, she went through several different asylums and then ended up in Northampton where she died in the 80s. And, you know, James, your sound is from from. You're, sorry, your okay. sound is cutting in and out a little really? bit. I wonder, there. I wonder why. That's strange. Anyway, um, so Lucia and um, Violet. I mean, you can find out great lots about Lucia by another book, actually, a book called um, uh, "To Dance in the Wake" by Carol Lieb Schloss, which is a wonderful book about Lucia Joyce. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that both of these women, who were fiercely independent thinkers, ended up um, put in asylum by their families. Now, they may have been mentally unstable in the, in the standards of the day, but only in the standards of the day. I think most 
you know, most of us will be considered mentally unstable as creators, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I, by this great tragedy and this extraordinary twist of fate, they both ended up in the same asylum. So um, that was already a, a point of interest to me. And also the fact that, um, that, that Violet so far in advance predicted that Mussolini was going to, you know, be, be the beginning of a, of a terrible wave of um of of dictatorship in Europe and was you know was the prime example for Hitler as well you know he was Hitler's mentor really and um and and so and and of course my parents lived through the Second World War as well so there were a lot of connections really um also funnily enough I had an aunt who was Italian who was a great supporter of Mussolini's oh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, and apparently my mother always told me that as soon as Mussolini, you know, started to be, be you know, be, be pursued and, and, and before he was assassinated, before he was killed, uh, you know, she, she decided that she better, she had, she had cushions with Mussolini's face on them. She turned the, cushion, she turned the cushions around. Yeah. That was probably <laughs> anyway. pretty common back then. I mean, yeah, for a very charismatic man, even though a very evil man as well. So. I mean, he was extraordinarily charismatic, you know, and 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 the sort of propaganda his propaganda was really powerful. So there were a lot of kind of a little bit connections through through my own, you know, my, my own family's experiences, and um, and seeing this parallel between Lucia and Violet were very different, but yet there was a kind of a, a, a very recognizable parallel in in how they their voice was suppressed. Um, and and so one of the things for me when I was when I was working on Violet Gibson is that I was very I was very clear that I did not want to portray her as unstable or mad. Yes, uh, maybe um, obsessed, you know, and and uh, and relentless in what she wanted to do, and and she had a certain kind of she had a certain kind of religious fervor as well. But I was very clear that um, we should show her for, and as the director was as well, that we should show her as a, as a woman who made her decision. So it, it does um, sound like she was more like a very passionate, very creative yeah. type of person, which I'm sure in 1920s Europe and Ireland, as you say, would have been seen in a, a different light, especially for a woman, I think, back then. Yeah, and particularly for a woman of her... Um, you know, social standing. Uh, like her family wrote to Mussolini to apologize profusely for what happened, and and I mean, they, she was really, you know, she the, no nobody from her environment would have seen anything of what she did as being anything other than crazy. Um, so and and then she, you know, she 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 went through a lot of changes in that time as well. You know, she 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 converted to Catholicism, all that sort of stuff. Okay. So. Um, so so yeah so so for me it was a, it was a journey of exploration as well you know to see what it would be like to um pursue this this thread with her and how it came about you're yeah, very interesting because you as a creative artist are often seen as someone right on the very cutting edge of passionate performance and creativity and probably some people would have branded you various things in the past just based on pushing those boundaries so oh, yeah you, there is definitely the the similarity i think in the between actor and the actual person which i think will show in the movie and will is a powerful well, force than in the movie i i hope so i mean like for me yeah i would always say that my my interest in my, my interest as an artist is very much you know, uh, is pushing the boundaries of, of of the accepted reality. You know, is to is to kind of create an alternative reality, and um and and I I, I often describe it as um you know uh, an artist's life is is it's or or making a work is is a an act of resistance against a prescribed reality. Yeah. So, um, so, so for me, yeah. So, 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 so I'm, I'm glad that you say that. But, but I've always been interested in, 
in being marginal as well. I, I think it's a very powerful, much better place to be, is to be on this kind of margin be in between art forms. And it gives you a different kind of perspective as well. For me, um, my work has never been career-based. It's always been a kind of pursuit. <laughs> it's always been a kind of a uh, following something. Mm -hmm. um, oh, excellent. So would you think it, it is important to for directors and writers to make these type of documentary films on individuals that have been more or less forgotten from I think very Irish important. history and then well there's been a big resurgence of interest in her it started i think in ireland it started with um the uh, radio documentary that um Siobhan Lynham based on the Francis Tono Saunders book. She then went to Italy and did this fantastic radio documentary, which inspired Lisa O'Neill's song. Okay. Um, and and also kind of set set Barry, who is Siobhan's partner, on the on the path towards making a, a, a documentary film on it. So there's been a whole thread of influence that has followed on from from the initial from Francis Tono Saunders book. Um, and um, and Siobhan doing this radio documentary, which won a few awards and is a fascinating radio documentary. You can probably still get it on the RTE archive. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. So For your listeners, I think you can get it probably. You have worked with um, Barry and Siobhan and Kevin in the past. Like you would have known them well before plans were afoot to make this movie. No, no, not really. I knew Barry a little bit. I did, I did something for, it was a, a, something related to asylum seekers. I did just a small thing for him quite a long time back. And also he produced a film, which I was in, um, about Artaud's, Antonin Artaud's visit to Ireland, which uh, a friend of mine, a, kind of a documentary film, which a friend of mine made. And I've also created a lot of, I created a, a big piece about Antonin Artaud's visit to Ireland. So that was where, um, so I contributed to that. Um, and I worked in a little bit, but I, we didn't really know each other very well. I didn't know Siobhan at all or Kevin. Um, so, but then out of the blue, uh, I got this email from Barry asking me, would I, would I be, will, would I be interested in, in playing this role? And I got, without even reading anything about her, I just got back straight away to say yes. <laughs> okay. So you knew kind yeah. of, in your core yeah. that it was something you wanted to I just knew yeah yes yeah. yes of course I'd be fascinated to do it yeah. oh, excellent and I guess that's a, a good way for you maybe like if you're a freelance artist for three four decades has that been the general way you end up in interesting projects you just get a feel for it and then you go go and jump yeah. in and do it I always have to have a, a feeling in my gut about it Mm -hmm. Or there has to be some kind of reason for me to want to do it. Um, there has to be a, a little hook, you know. But there, there was, there was there, that was just straight away, you know, when he said the Irish woman who shot Mussolini, I said, oh, that's enough. That's enough for me. <laughs> <It's old. laughs> yeah, I'll definitely do it. Not yeah. knowing that much about her. And then I, then I listened to the radio documentary and I read the book and, you know, I was thinking I, I felt very fortunate actually to get an opportunity to do it. Oh, hold on a second. Yep. Sorry. No, no problem. Somebody coming in to try and fix the heating. Okay. Um, like what were some of the highlights of working with like director and writer Barry and Kevin and then the writer Siobhan throughout the course of the film? Could you pick any kind of two or three highlights? Hard to say what the highlight. I, I can't think of any particular highlights. I mean, there were there were lots of lots of great memories. You know, um, I mean, it was interesting going to Rome to shoot because obviously we couldn't. It wasn't the kind of budget where you could stop the you know empty the street and all that kind of stuff. So they had to fiddle. Around. They had to do a lot of stuff with green screen and things like that. But we did we did shoot in Rome a bit. Um, it was it was quite. It was quite something going to the convent where she'd stayed. That was quite something in Rome. And um, and just, uh, I think it was also the, the fact that it was a very small shoot. Um, and so there was a very, we were a very tight knit band doing it, you know, and that always helps. I think there was no big production. It was very, uh, it was very much a, a labor of love in many ways. 
um, you know, I mean, everybody was paid decently and everything like that. It wasn't, it wasn't like that, but yeah. there was, it was, people were doing it because they really wanted to do it, you know, and, and it wasn't too big. A, it, it was just a small group of us. And, uh, and we, we all got on really well and it was all quite fluid as well. Like I would get new bits of script handwritten <laughs> before starting a scene and I go, yeah. so I'd stand there and kind of edit it down and go, okay, well, you know, just do this. <laughs> Things like so that. A little bit off the cuff sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, a good way, you know, sometimes it's very good to do things off the cuff like that. And you don't, you don't think about it too much. And... So do you, do you think the synergy builds up between you and the director, like over the course of the shoot, where you kind of get more used to maybe it's funny how, enough. I how don't feel like it's, yeah, I funny enough, I don't feel it's between me and the director. I think okay. it's between me. I think it's between me and the material. Okay. I that's think that's the synergy. Yeah. That's the synergy that happens. A direct, you know, a director obviously will be brilliant for um, helping you carve what you're doing, but the synergy is actually with the material, mm. interestingly enough. And I think it's the same with theatre. That's where the syn real synergy happens is how you and the material somehow are be maybe fused or become one. Kind of become closer to the character, maybe, over yeah, time. Yeah, and, uh, and I don't even think of it as character sometimes. It's just what it is being said, what's mm -hmm. being said, what's, okay. being, what's being given, offered. Yeah. Oh, it is really interesting. Um, well, look, it was lovely to talk to you. And yeah, I'm sorry for the delay. I mean, yeah, it was not, two. No worries at all. It was two things. One is I I forgot, so I was a few minutes late, and then I couldn't get the bloody thing working. Anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, so, I hope your hotel yeah, warms please. up a bit and enjoy the yeah, shoot, and uh, I'll keep an eye out for interesting things coming from your way in the future. Okay. Great. Thanks, Owen. Thank you, Owen. Bye. Have a good one. Bye.